चैप्टर फिफ्टी फाइव और बुक थ्री पार्ट ट्वेंटी सिक्स द वाइंड अप बर्ड क्रॉनिकल नंबर एट और ए सेकेंड क्लमजी मैसेकर द वेटेरिनेरियन वॉक बिफोर सिक्स ए एम आफ्टर वॉशिंग हिज फेस इन कोल्ड वाटर ही मेड हिमसेल्फ ब्रेकफास्ट डे ब्रेक केम एट एन अर्ली आवर इन समर एंड मोस्ट ऑफ द एनिमल्स इन द जू वेर ऑलरेडी अवेक The open window let in their cries and the breeze that carried their smells which told him the weather without his having to look outside. This was part of his routine. He would first listen then inhale the morning air and so ready himself for its new day. Today, however, should have been different from the day before. It had to be different. So many voices and smells had been lost. The tigers, the leopards, the wolves, the bears all had been liquidated. eliminated by soldiers the previous afternoon now after a night of sleep those events seemed like part of a sluggish nightmare he had had long ago but he knew they had actually happened his ears still felt a dull ache from the roar of the soldiers rifles that could not be a dream it was august now the year was 1945 and he was here in the city of sinching where the soviet troops that had burst across the border were pressing closer every hour This was reality as real as the sink and toothbrush he saw in front of him the sound of the elephant's trumpeting gave him some sense of relief ah yes the elephants had survived fortunately the young lieutenant in charge of the platoon had had enough normal human sensitivity to remove the elephants from the list thought the veterinarian as he washed his face Since coming to Manchuria he had made any number of stiff-necked fanatical young officers from his homeland and the experience always left him shaken most of them were farmers sons who had spent their youthful years in the depressed 30s steeped in the tragedies of poverty while a megalomaniac nationalism was hammered into their skulls they would follow without a second thought the orders of a superior no matter how outlandish commanded in the name of the emperor to dig a hole through the earth to brazil they would grab a shovel and set to work some people call this purity but the veterinarian had other words for it an urban doctor's son educated in the relatively liberal atmosphere of the 20s the veterinarian could never understand those young officers shooting a couple of elephants with a small arm should have been far easier than digging through the earth to brazil but the lieutenant in charge of the firing squad though he spoke with a slight country accent seemed to be a more normal human being than the other young officers the veterinarian had met better educated and more reasonable the veterinarian could sense this from the way the young man spoke and handled himself in any case the elephants had not been killed and the veterinarian told himself he should probably be grateful the soldiers too must have been glad to be spared the task The Chinese workers may have regretted the omission. They had missed out on a lot of meat and ivory. The veterinarian boiled water in a kettle, soaked his beard in a hot towel, and shaved. Then he ate breakfast alone, tea, toast, and butter. The food rations in Manchuria were far from sufficient, but compared with those elsewhere, they were still fairly generous. This was good news both for him and for the animals. The animals showed resentment at their reduced allotments of feed, but the situation here was far better than in Japanese homeland zoos, where food stuffs had already bottomed out. No one could predict the future, but for now, at least, both animals and humans were being spared the pain of extreme hunger. He wondered how his wife and daughter were doing. If all went according to plan, their train should have arrived in Busan by now. There his cousin lived who worked for the railway company and until the veterinarian's wife and daughter were able to board the transport ship that would carry them to Japan they would stay with the cousin's family the doctor missed seeing them when he woke up in the morning he missed hearing their lively voices as they prepared breakfast or hollow quiet ruled the house this was no longer the home he loved the place where he belonged and yet at the same time he could not help feeling a certain strange joy at being left alone in this empty official residence now he was able to sense the implacable power of fate in his every bones and flesh fate itself was the doctor's own fatal disease from his youngest days he had had a weirdly lucid awareness that i as an individual am living under the control of some outside force this may have been owing to the vivid blue mark on his right cheek 
While still a child, he hated this mark, this imprint that only he and no one else had to bear upon his flesh. He wanted to die whenever the other children taunted him or strangers stared at him. If only he could have caught away that part of his body with a knife. But as he matured, he gradually came to a quiet acceptance of the mark on his face that would never go away. And this may have been a factor that helped form his attitude of resignation in all matters having to do with fate. Most of the time, the power of fate played on like a quiet and monotonous ground bass, coloring only the edges of his life. Rarely was he reminded of its existence. But every once in a while, when the balance would shift, and what controlled the balance he never knew, he could discover no regularity in those shifts, the force would increase, plunging him into a state of near paralytic resignation. At such times, he had no choice but to abandon everything and give himself to the flow. He knew from experience that nothing he could do or think would ever change the situation. Fate would demand its portion, and until it received that portion, it would never go away. He believed this with his whole heart. Not that he was a passive creature. Indeed, he was more decisive than most, and he always saw his decisions through. In his profession, he was outstanding, a veterinarian of exceptional skill, a tireless educator, he may have lacked a certain creative spark, but in school, he always had superior grades and was chosen to be the leader of the class. In the workplace, too, others acknowledged his superiority, and his juniors always looked up to him. He was certainly no fatalist, as most people use the word, and yet never once in his life had he experienced the unshakable certainty that he, and he alone, had arrived at a decision. He always had the sense that fate had forced him to decide things to suit its own convenience. On occasion, after the momentary satisfaction of having decided something of his own free will, he would see that things had been decided beforehand by an external power cleverly camouflaged as free will, mere bait thrown in his path to lure him into behaving as he was meant to. The only things that he had decided for himself with complete independence were the kind of trivial matters which, on closer inspection, revealed themselves to require no decision-making at all. He felt like a titular head of a state who did nothing more than impress the royal seal on documents at the behest of a regent who wielded all true power in the realm, like the emperor of this puppet empire of Manchuku. The doctor loved his wife and child. They were the most wonderful thing that had ever happened to him in his life, especially his daughter, for whom his love bordered on obsession. For them, he would have gladly given up his life. Indeed, he had often imagined doing so, and the deaths he had endured for them in his mind seemed the sweetest deaths imaginable. At the same time, however, he would often come home from work, and seeing his wife and daughter there, think to himself, these people are finally separate human beings, with whom I have no connection. They were something other, something of which he had no true knowledge, something that existed in a place far away from the doctor himself. And whenever he felt this way, the thought would cross his mind that he himself had chosen neither of these people on his own, which did not prevent him from loving them unconditionally, without the slightest reservation. This was, for the doctor, a great paradox, an insoluble contradiction, a gigantic trap that had been set for him in his life. The world he belonged to became far simpler, far easier to understand. Though once he was left alone in his residence at the zoo, all he had to think about was taking care of the animals. His wife and daughter were gone. There was no need to think about them for now. The veterinarian and his fate could be alone together. And it was fate above all, the gigantic power of fate, that held sway over the city of Xinjiang. In August of 1945, not the Kwangtung army, not the Soviet army, not the troops of the communists or the Kuomintang. Anyone could see that fate was the ruler here, and that individual will counted for nothing. It was fate that had spared the elephants and buried the tigers and leopards and wolves and bears the day before. What would it bury now, and what would it spare? These were questions that no one could answer. The doctor left his residence to prepare for the morning feeding. He assumed that no one would show up for work anymore. But he found two Chinese boys waiting for him in his office. He did not know them. They were 13 or 14 years old, dark-complected and skinny with roving animal eyes. 
They told us to help you, said one boy. The doctor nodded. He asked their names, but they made no reply. Their faces remained blank, as if they had not heard the question. These boys had obviously been sent by the Chinese people who had walked here until the day before. Those people had probably ended all contact with Japanese now, in anticipation of changes to come, but assumed that children would not be held accountable. The boys had been sent as a sign of goodwill. The workers knew that he could not care for the animals alone. The veterinarian gave each boy two cookies, then put them to work helping him feed the animals. They led a mule-drawn cart from cage to cage, providing each animal with its particular feed and changing its water. Cleaning the cages was out of the question. The best they could manage was a quick hose down to wash away the droppings. The zoo was closed, after all. No one would complain if it stank a little. As it turned out, the absence of the tigers, leopards, bears, and wolves made the job far easier. Caring for the big carnivores was a major effort and dangerous. As bad as the doctor felt when passing their empty cages, he could not suppress a sense of relief to have been spared that job. They started the work at 8 o'clock and finished after 10. The boys then disappeared without a word. The veterinarian felt exhausted from the hard physical labor. He went back to the office and reported to the zoo director that the animals had been fed. Just before noon, the young lieutenant came back to the zoo, leading the same air soldiers he had brought with him the day before. Fully armed again, they walked with a metallic clinking that could be heard far in advance of their arrival. Again their shirts were blackened with sweat, and again the cicadas were screaming in the trees. Today, however, they had not come to kill animals. The lieutenant saluted the director and said, We need to know the current status of the Jews' usable cars and draft animals. The director informed him that they had exactly one mule and one wagon. We contributed our only truck and two horses two weeks ago, he noted. The lieutenant nodded and announced that he would immediately commandeer his mule and wagon, as per orders of Kwangtung Army Headquarters. Wait a minute, the veterinarian interjected. We need those to feed the animals twice a day. All our local people have disappeared. Without that mule and wagon, our animals will starve to death. Even with them, we can barely keep up. We're all just barely keeping up, sir, said the lieutenant, whose eyes were red and whose face was covered with stubble. Our first priority is to defend the city. You can always let the animals out of their cages if need be. We've taken care of the dangerous meat eaters. The others pose no security risk. These are military orders, sir. You'll just have to manage as you see fit. Cutting the discussion short, the lieutenant had his men take the mule and wagon. When they were gone, the veterinarian and the director looked at each other. The director sipped his tea, shook his head and said nothing. Four hours later, the soldiers were back with the mule and wagon. A filthy canvas tarpaulin covering the mounded contents of the wagon. The mule was panting, its hide foaming with the afternoon heat and the weight of the load. The air soldiers marched four Chinese men ahead of them at bayonet point. Young men, perhaps 20 years old, wearing baseball uniforms and with their hands tied behind their backs. The black and blue marks on their faces made it obvious that they had been severely beaten. The right eye of one man was swollen, almost shut, and the bleeding lips of the other had stained his baseball shirt bright red. The shirt fronts had nothing written on them, but there were small rectangles where the name patches had been torn off. The numbers on their backs were 1, 4, 7, and 9. The veterinarian could not begin to imagine why, at such a time of crisis, four young Chinese men would be wearing baseball uniforms, or why they had been so badly beaten and dragged here by Japanese troops. The scene looked like something not of this world, a painting by a mental patient. The lieutenant asked the zoo director if he had any picks and shovels he could let them use. The young officer looked even more pale and haggard than he had before. The veterinarian led him and his men to a tool shed behind the office. The lieutenant chose two picks and two shovels for his men. Then he asked the veterinarian to come with him and leaving his men there, walked into a thicket beyond the road. The veterinarian followed. Wherever the lieutenant walked, huge grasshoppers scattered. The smell of summer grass hung in the air, mixed in with the deafening scream of cicadas, the sharp trumpeting of elephants now and then seemed to sound a distant warning.
They lived in and went on among the trees without speaking, until he found a kind of opening in the woods. The area had been slated for construction of a plaza for small animals that children could play with. The plan had been postponed indefinitely, however, when the worsening military situation caused the shortage of construction materials. The trees had been cleared away to make a circle of bare ground, and the sun illuminated this one part of the woods like stage lighting. The lieutenant stood in the center of the circle and scanned the area. Then he dug at the ground with the heel of his boot. We're going to bivouac here for a while, he said, kneeling down and scooping up a handful of dirt. The veterinarian nodded in response. He had no idea why they had to bivouac in a zoo, but he decided not to ask. Here in Xinjiang, experience had taught him never to question military men. Questions did nothing but make them angry, and they never gave you a straight answer in any case. First we dig a big hole here, the lieutenant said, speaking as if to himself. He stood up and took a pack of cigarettes from his short pocket. Putting a cigarette between his lips, he offered one to the doctor, then lit Booth with a match. The two concentrated on their smoking to fill the silence. Again the lieutenant began digging at the ground with his foot. He drew a kind of diagram in the earth, then rubbed it out. Finally, he asked the veterinarian, Where were you born? In Kanagawa, the doctor said, in a town called Ofuna, near the sea. The lieutenant nodded. And where were you born? The veterinarian asked. Instead of answering, the lieutenant narrowed his eyes and watched the smoke rising from between his fingers. No, it never pays to ask a military man questions. The veterinarian told himself again. They like to ask questions, but they'll never give you an answer. They wouldn't give you the time of day, literally. There's a movie studio there, said the lieutenant. It took the doctor a few seconds to realize the lieutenant was talking about Ofuna. That's right, a big studio. I've never been inside, though. The lieutenant dropped what was left of his cigarette on the ground and crushed it out. I hope you make it back there, he said. Of course, there's an ocean to cross between here and Japan. We'll probably all die over here. He kept his eyes on the ground as he spoke. Tell me, doctor, are you afraid of death? I guess it depends on how you die, said the veterinarian after a moment's thought. The lieutenant raised his eyes and looked at the veterinarian as if his curiosity had been aroused. He had apparently been expecting another answer. You're right, he said. It does depend on how you die. The two remained silent for a time. The lieutenant looked as if he might just fall asleep there, standing up. He was obviously exhausted. An especially large grasshopper flew over them like a bird and disappeared into a distant clump of grass with noisy beating of wings. The lieutenant looked at his watch. Time to get started, he said to no one in particular. Then he spoke to the veterinarian. I'd like you to stay around for a while. I might have you to ask you to do me a favor. The veterinarian nodded. The soldiers led the Chinese prisoners to the opening in the woods and untied their hands. The corporal drew a large circle on the ground using a baseball bat. Though why a soldier would have a bat, the veterinarian found another mystery and ordered the prisoners in Japanese to dig a deep hole the size of the circle. With the picks and shovels, the four men in baseball uniforms started digging in silence. Half the squad stood guard over them, while the other half stretched out beneath the trees. They seemed to be in desperate need of sleep. No sooner had they hit the ground in full gear than they began snoring. The four soldiers who remained awake kept watch over the digging nearby, rifles resting on their hips, bayonets fixed, ready for immediate use. The lieutenant and the corporal took turns overseeing the work and napping under the trees. It took less than an hour for the four Chinese prisoners to dig a hole some 12 feet across and deep enough to come up to their necks. One of the men asked for water, speaking in Japanese. The lieutenant nodded and a soldier brought a bucket full of water. The four Chinese took turns ladling the water from the bucket and gulping it down. They drank almost the entire bucket full. Their uniforms were smeared black with blood, smud and sweat. The lieutenant had two of the soldiers pull the wagon over the hole. The corporal yanked the tarpaulin off to reveal four dead men piled in the wagon. They wore the same baseball uniforms as the prisoners, and they, too, were obviously Chinese. They appeared to have been shot, and their uniforms were covered with black blood stains. 
Large flies were beginning to swarm over the corpses. Judging from the way the blood had dried, the doctor guessed they had been dead for close to 24 hours. The lieutenant ordered the four Chinese who had dug the hole to throw the bodies into it. Without a word, faces blank, the men took the bodies out of the wagon and threw them, one at a time, into the hole. Each corpse landed with a dull thud. The numbers on the dead men's uniforms were 2, 5, 6, and 8. The veterinarian committed them to memory. When the four Chinese had finished throwing the bodies into the hole, the soldiers tied each man to a nearby tree. The lieutenant held up his wrist and studied his watch with a grim expression. Then he looked up toward a spot in the sky for a while, as if searching for something there. He looked like a station master standing on the platform and waiting for a hopelessly overdue train. But in fact, he was looking at nothing at all. He was just allowing a certain amount of time to go by. Once he had accomplished that, he turned to a corporal and gave him court orders to bayonet three of the four prisoners, one, seven, and nine. Three soldiers were chosen and took up their positions in front of the three Chinese. The soldiers looked paler than the men they were about to kill. The Chinese looked too tired to hope for anything. The corporal offered each of them a smoke, but they refused. He put his cigarettes back into his short pocket. Taking the veterinarian with him, the lieutenant went to stand somewhat apart from the other soldiers. You'd better watch this, he said. This is another way to die. The veterinarian nodded. The lieutenant is not saying this to me, he thought. He's saying it to himself. In a gentle voice, the lieutenant explained. Shooting them would be the simplest and the most efficient way to kill them. But we have orders not to waste a single bullet. And certainly not to waste bullets killing Chinese. We're supposed to save our ammunition for the Russians. We'll just bayonet them, I suppose. But that's not as easy as it sounds. By the way, doctor... Did they teach you how to use a bayonet in the army? The doctor explained that as a cavalry veterinarian, he had not been trained to use a bayonet. Well, the proper way to kill a man with a bayonet is this. First he thrust it in under the ribs there. The lieutenant pointed to his own torso just above the stomach. Then he dragged the point in a big, deep circle inside him to scramble the organs. Then he thrust upward to puncture the hurt. You can't just stick it in and expect him to die. We soldiers have this drummed into us. Hand-to-head -hand combat using bayonets ranks right up there along with night assaults as the pride of the Imperial Army. Though mainly, it's a lot cheaper than tanks and planes and cannons. Of course, you can trail all you want. But finally, what you're stabbing is a straw doll, not a live human being. It doesn't bleed or scream or spill its guts on the ground. These soldiers have never actually killed a human being that way, and neither have I. The lieutenant looked at the corporal and gave him a nod. The corporal barked his orders to the three soldiers, who snapped to attention. Then they took a half step back and thrust out their bayonets, each man aiming his blade at his prisoner. One of the young men, number seven, growled something in Chinese that sounded like a curse and gave a defined spit which never reached the ground but dribbled down the throat of his baseball uniform. At the sound of the next order, the three soldiers thrust their bayonets into the Chinese men with tremendous force. Then, as the lieutenant had said, they twisted the blades so as to rip the men's internal organs and thrust the tips upward. The cries of the Chinese men were not very loud, more like deep sobs than screams, as if they were heaving out the breath left in their bodies all at once through a single opening. The soldiers pulled their bayonets and stepped back. The corporal barked his order again, and the men repeated this procedure exactly as before, stabbing, twisting, thrusting upward, withdrawing. The veterinarian watched in numbed silence, overtaken by the sense that he was beginning to split in two. He became simultaneously the stabber and the stabbed. He could feel both the impact of the bayonet as it entered his victim's body and the pain of having his internal organs slashed to bits. It took much longer than he would have imagined for the Chinese men to die. Their sliced up bodies poured prodigious amounts of blood on the ground, but even with their organs shredded, they went on twitching slightly for quite some time. The corporal used his own bayonet to cut the ropes that bound the men to the trees, and then he had the soldiers who had not participated in the killing help drag the fallen bodies to the hole and throw them in.
These corpses also made a dull thud on impact. But the doctor couldn't help feeling that the sound was different from that made by the earlier corpses, probably because they were not entirely dead yet. Now only the young Chinese prisoner with the number 4 on his shirt was left. The three pale-faced soldiers tore broad leaves from plants at their feet and proceeded to wipe their bloody bayonets. Not only blood but strange colored body fluids and chunks of flesh added to the blades. The men had to use many leaves to return the bayonets to their original bare metal shine. The veterinarian wondered why only the one man, number 4, had been left alive. But he was not going to ask questions. The lieutenant took out another cigarette and lit up. He then offered a smoke to the veterinarian, who accepted it in silence. After putting it between his lips, struck his own match. His hand did not tremble, but it seemed to have lost all feeling, as if he were wearing thick gloves. These men were cadets in the Manchukuo Army Officer Candidate School, said the lieutenant. They refused to participate in the defense of Xinjiang. They killed two of their Japanese instructors last night and tried to run away. We caught them during night patrol, killed four of them on the spot and captured the other four. Two more escaped in the dark. The lieutenant rubbed his beard with the palm of his hand. They were trying to make their getaway in baseball uniforms. I guess they figured they'd be arrested as deserters if they wore their military uniforms. Or maybe they were afraid of what communist troops would do to them if they were caught in their Manchukuo uniforms. Anyway, all they had in their barracks to wear besides their cadet outfits were uniforms of the officer candidate school baseball team. So they tore off the names and tried to get away wearing these. I don't know if you know, but the school had a great team. They used to go to Taiwan and Korea for friendship games. That guy. And here the lieutenant motioned toward the man tied to the tree was the captain of the team and the batted cleanup. We think he was the one who organized the getaway. He killed the two instructors with a bat. The instructors knew there was trouble in the barracks and weren't going to distribute weapons to the cadets until it was an absolute emergency. But they forgot about the baseball bats. Both of them had their skulls cracked open. They probably died instantly. Two perfect home runs. This is the bat. The lieutenant had the corporal bring the bat to him. He passed the bat to the veterinarian. The doctor took it in both hands and held it up in front of his face, the way a player does when stepping into the batter's box. It was just an ordinary bat, not very well made, with a rough finish and an uneven grain. It was heavy, though, and well broken in. The handle was black with sweat. It didn't look like a bat that had been used recently to kill two human beings. After getting a feel for its wet, the veterinarian handed it back to the lieutenant who gave it a few easy swings, handling it like an expert. Do you play baseball? The lieutenant asked the veterinarian. All the time when I was a kid? Too grown up now? No more baseball for me, the veterinarian said. And when he was on the verge of asking, how about you, lieutenant? When he swallowed his words. I've been ordered to beat this guy to death with the same bat he used. The lieutenant said in a dry voice as he tapped the ground with the tip of the bat. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Just between you and me, I think the order stinks. What the hell good is it going to do to kill these guys? We don't have any planes left. We don't have any warships. Our base troops are dead. Some kind of special new bomb wiped out the whole city of Hiroshima in a split second. We're either going to be swept out of Manchuria or we'll all be killed. And China will belong to the Chinese again. We've already killed a lot of Chinese, and adding a few bodies to the count isn't going to make any difference. But orders are orders. I am a soldier, and I have to follow orders. We killed the tigers and leopards yesterday, and today we have to kill these guys. So take a good look, doctor. This is another way for people to die. You're a doctor, so you're probably used to knives and blood and guts, but you've probably never seen anyone beaten to death with a baseball bat. The lieutenant ordered the corporal to bring player number four, the cleaner batter, to the edge of the hole. Once again, they tied his hands behind his back. Then they blindfolded him and had him kneel down on the ground. He was a tall, strongly built young man with massive arms the size of most people's thighs. The lieutenant called over one young soldier and handed him the bat. Kill him with this, he said. The young soldier stood at attention and saluted before taking the bat. But having taken it in his hands, 
He just went on standing there, as if stupefied. He seemed unable to grasp the concept of beating a Chinese man to death with a baseball bat. Have you ever played baseball? The lieutenant asked the young soldier, the one who would eventually have his skull split open with a shovel by a Soviet guard in a mine near Irkutsk. No, sir, never, replied the soldier in a loud voice. But the village in Hokkaido where he was born and the village in Manchuria where he grew up had been so poor that no family in either place could have afforded the luxury of a baseball or a bat. He had spent his boyhood running around the fields, catching dragonflies and playing at sword fighting with sticks. He had never in his life played baseball or even seen a game. This was the first time he had ever held a bat. The lieutenant showed him how to hold the bat and taught him the basics of the swing demonstrating himself a few times. See, it's all in the hips. He grunted through the clenched teeth. Starting from the backswing, you twist from the waist down. The tip of the bat follows through naturally. Understand? If you concentrate too much on swinging the bat, your arms do all the work and you lose power. Swing from the hips. The soldier didn't seem fully to comprehend the lieutenant's instructions. But he took off his heavy gear as ordered and practiced his swing for a while. Everyone was watching him. The lieutenant placed his hands over the soldiers to help him adjust his grip. He was a good teacher. Before long, the soldier's swing, though somewhat awkward, was swishing through the air. What the young soldiers lacked in skill made up for in muscle power, having spent his days working on the farm. That's good enough, said the lieutenant, using his hat to wipe the sweat from his brow. Okay, now, try to do it in one good clean swing. Don't let him suffer. What he really wanted to say was, I don't want to do this any more than you do. Who the hell could have thought of anything so stupid? Killing a guy with a baseball bat. But an officer could never say such a thing to an enlisted man. The soldier stepped up behind the blindfolded Chinese man where he knelt on the ground. When the soldier raised the bat, the strong rays of the setting sun cast the bat's long, thick shadow on the earth. This is so weird, thought the veterinarian. The lieutenant was right. I've never seen a man killed with a baseball bat. The young soldier held the bat aloft for a long time. The doctor saw its tip shaking. The lieutenant nodded to the soldier. With a deep breath, the soldier took a back swing, then smashed the bat with all his strength into the back of the Chinese cadet's head. He did it amazingly well. He swung his hips exactly as the lieutenant had taught him to. The brand of the bat made a direct hit behind the man's ears and the bat followed through perfectly. There was a dull crushing sound as the skull shattered. The man himself made no sound. His body hung in the air for a moment in a strange pose, then flopped forward. He lay with his cheek on the ground, blood flowing from one ear. He did not move. The lieutenant looked at his watch. Still gripping the bat, the young soldier stared off into space, his mouth agape. The lieutenant was a person who did things with great care. He waited for a full minute. When he was certain that the young Chinese was not moving at all, he said to the veterinarian, Could you do me a favor and check to see if he's really dead? The veterinarian nodded, walked over to where the young Chinese lay, knelt down and removed his blindfold. The man's eyes were wide open, the pupils turned upward, and bright red blood was flowing from his ear. His half-open mouth revealed the tongue lying tangled inside. The impact had left his neck twisted at a strange angle. The man's nostrils had expelled thick gobs of blood, making black stains on the dry ground. One particularly alert and large fly had already burrowed its way into a nostril to lay eggs. Just to make sure, the veterinarian took the man's wrist and felt for a pulse. There was no pulse, certainly not where there was supposed to be one. The young soldier had ended this burly man's life with a single swing of a bat, indeed, his first ever swing of a bat. The veterinarian glanced toward the lieutenant and nodded to signal that the man was, without a doubt, dead. Having completed his assigned task, he was beginning slowly to rise to his full height when it seemed to him that the sun shining on his back suddenly increased in intensity. At that very moment, the young Chinese batter in uniform number 4 rose up into a sitting position as if he had just come fully awake. Without the slightest uncertainty or hesitation, or so it seemed to those watching, 
He grabbed the doctor's wrist. It all happened in a split second. The veterinarian could not understand. This man was dead. He was sure of it. But now, thanks to one last drop of life that seemed to well up from nowhere, the man was gripping the doctor's wrist with the strength of a steel vice. Eyelids stretched open to the limit, pupils still glaring upward. The man fell forward into the hole, dragging the doctor in after him. The doctor fell in top of him and heard one of the man's ribs crack as his weight came down. Still, the Chinese ball player continued to grip his wrist. The soldiers saw all this happening, but they were too stunned to do anything more than stand and watch. The lieutenant recovered first and leaped into the hole. He drew his pistol from his holster, set the muzzle against the Chinese man's head and pulled the trigger twice. Two sharp, overlapping cracks rang out and a large black hole opened in the man's temple. Now his life was completely gone, but still he refused to release the doctor's wrist. The lieutenant knelt down and pistol in one hand, began the painstaking process of prying open the corpse's fingers one at a time. The veterinarian lay there in the hole, surrounded by eight silent Chinese corpses in baseball uniforms. Down in the hole, the screeching of cicadas sounded very different from the way it sounded above ground. Once the veterinarian had been freed from the dead man's grasp, the soldiers pulled him and the lieutenant out of the grave. The veterinarian squatted down on the grass and took several deep breaths. Then he looked at his wrist. The man's fingers had left five bright red marks. On this hot August afternoon, the veterinarian felt chilled to the core of his body. I'll never get rid of this coldness, he thought. This man was truly, seriously, trying to take me with him wherever he was going. The lieutenant reset the pistol safety and carefully slipped the gun into its holster. This was the first time he had ever fired a gun at a human being, but he tried not to think about it. The war would continue for a little while at least, and people would continue to die. He could leave the deep thinking for later. He wiped his sweaty right palm on his pants, then ordered the soldiers who had not participated in the execution to fill in the hole. A huge swarm of flies had already taken custody of the pile of corpses. The young soldiers went on standing where he was, stupefied, gripping the bat. He couldn't seem to make his hands let go. The lieutenant and the corporal left him alone. He had seemed to be watching the whole bizarre series of events. The dead Chinese suddenly grabbing the veterinarian by the wrist. They're falling into the grave, the lieutenant slipping in and finishing him off, and now the other soldiers filling in the hole. But in fact, he had not been watching any of it. He had been listening to the winder bird. As it had been the previous afternoon, the bird was in a tree somewhere, making that creak, creak sound as if winding a spring. The soldier looked up, trying to pinpoint the direction of the cries, but he could see no sign of the bird. He felt a slight sense of nausea at the back of his throat, though nothing as violent as yesterday's. As he listened to the winding of the spring, the young soldier saw one fragmentary image after another rise up before him and fade away. After they were disarmed by the Soviets, the young paymaster lieutenant would be handed over to the Chinese and hanged for his responsibility in these executions. The corporal would die of the plague in a Siberian concentration camp. He would be thrown into a quarantine shed and left there until dead. Though in fact he had merely collapsed from malnutrition and had not contracted the plague, not at least until he was thrown into the shed. The veterinarian with the mark on his face would die in an accident a year later. A civilian, he would be taken by the Soviets for cooperating with the military and sent to another Siberian camp to do hard labor. He would be working in a deep shaft of a Siberian coal mine when a flood would drown him, along with many soldiers and I, thought the young soldier with the bat in his hands. But he could not see his own future. He could not even see the events that were transpiring before his very eyes. He now closed his eyes and listened to the call of the winder bird. Then all at once, he thought of the ocean. The ocean he had seen from the deck of the ship that brought him from Japan to Manchuria. He had never seen the ocean before, nor had he seen it since. That had happened eight years ago. He could still remember the smell of the salt air. The ocean was one of the greatest things he had ever seen in his life, bigger and deeper than anything he had imagined. It changed its color and shape and expression according to time and place and weather.
It aroused a deep sadness in his heart, and at the same time, it brought his heart peace and comfort. Would he ever see it again? He loosened his grip and let the bat fall to the ground. It made a dry sound as it struck the earth. After the bat left his hands, he felt a slight increase in his nausea. The wind-up bird went on crying, but no one else could hear its call. Here ended the wind-up bird chronicle number eight.